I'm a technology guy. I see the world the same way all of you do. I see the same news. The news is pretty crummy most of the time, in part because that's what they like to report, but it's pretty hard to deny. There's a lot of crummy stuff in this world. And I always think of technology as a potential solution. It's the tool I work with best. And while I do mostly medical stuff, give you a piece of news on healthcare. If everybody in this room could think of every disease you could name, cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, MS, and stage renal failure, just add them all up. They constitute 50% of all of human chronic illness. And they'll be solved one by one. We pour lots of money into them, we're solving them. All by itself, the other 50% of chronic human disease is bad water. You just heard somebody talk about the bottom billion, but it's almost two billion people now in rising that make a choice every day between no water or bad water. You heard what it does with food. Well, 20% of the GDP of the poorest 20 countries in the world pays for water that gets hauled around by women for four hours a day. Then they drink it and two million people die a year, most of them kids. You look also, as you heard, that we've had major institutions since 1948 trying to solve these problems. They've spent literally a trillion dollars. You've heard somebody else say it might now be a 19th century mind trying to solve a 21st century problem. I don't know about the politics and the economics. I can tell you it's certainly trying to apply a 19th century set of technologies. It seemed to me that with the right technologies, we ought to be able to get machines out to people to make any source of water pure. We ought to be able to run those machines in any local environment. So, I started looking at different ways to do that, and while anybody can tell you, all the water experts in the world, if it's got salt in it, use osmosis membranes. If it's got cryptosporidium and gerardia from surface water and bio burden, use chlorine. You put the chlorine in it, you'll kill all that stuff. It'll still have fecal matter floating around, it'll still be turbid, it'll still stink, it'll still smell. You wouldn't give it to your dog, but you might be able to drink it if you were smart enough and had the infrastructure to know where to get the chlorine every day and know how to titrate the right amount in. If you went to one of the one and a half million deep wells, for instance, in Bangladesh, that were dug so that you don't have to take surface water, you get below the bio burden, unfortunately, you get into minerals. Around here, the mineral you get into is iron. It's that terrible stuff in our water leave spots on the glasses. The iron isn't in the minerals in most of Asia. The, the metal there is arsenic. It kills you. So you gotta be able to take arsenic and inorganics and hexavalent chrome out. You gotta be able to take salt out if you're near the ocean. You gotta take bio burden out. I wish I had time to tell you how we do it because the technology is really cool. But we said, we gotta build a box small enough that it can be carried into any village, because about 900 million of the people that need this stuff are in small villages, or peri-urban slums, as you heard. We set ourselves a goal of develop a technology that requires no membranes for salt water, no chemicals if it's bio-burden, no activated charcoal or ion collection if it's heavy metals, because most of the places don't have Walmart at the corner to buy this stuff. And they don't have in the village the epidemiologist, the microbiologist, the organic chemist, the physiologist. They gotta have something simple that's robust that works. So we set ourselves the goal of build a machine about the size of this podium that has two hoses on it. One you stick into anything that looks wet. A latrine, the ocean, a chemical waste site. Out of the other end comes water that would meet the US pharmacopoeia standard for water for injection. And we built them. The goal, the goal was to make a machine that would last five years without a lot of maintenance and require no disposables. We didn't get a lot of support for trying the theory out, so I took a, some of my engineers and we put them in Honduras for a month. A machine this size makes a thousand liters a day, it serves easily a hundred people. Manufactured in high volume like a typical 
appliance, it would be a couple of thousand bucks or less. For 300 million people in Africa, you need three million machines. You can do the math, it's pretty cheap. Even if you'd looked at all the power it consumes, it costs about 1.9 cents to make a liter of water. It costs 25 cents to move that around in bottles here. We thought that would be a good idea. The problem is, although it has all the magic I just told you, doesn't care what's wrong with the water, it does need something to run it. Electricity. But the poorest people in the world need electricity anyway. Not just to run this, but the two most basic human needs to get people out of poverty. Give them water and a little bit of energy. Not the kind of electricity we use, no jacuzzis, hair dryers. But in a small village, if there was just enough electricity, especially with LEDs these days, to give the same hundred people that would live off one machine enough power that everybody could have a phone, a computer, enough light at night to be safe, to read, to learn, to be on the internet, to get to truth, it would take a couple of kilowatts. So we took another neat old technology, and based on the time, I will not be able to explain how it works, but it's a closed cycle, hermetically sealed can, that uses any external source of heat, any external source of heat, solar photovoltaics, or make electricity, well, we can, we don't need the photovoltaics. We can just take the sunlight. We can take cow dung. We built these machines. We made one, again, about the size of this, carry it into the same village, makes a couple of kilowatts, run on any source of heat. We moved two machines to Bangladesh, one 75 kilometers north of their capital in Dhaka, one about 75 kilometers west, a 20-family village and a 30-family village. And for 24 weeks, around the clock, these boxes produced enough power for these families for the first time ever to use electricity. Everybody had a little light at night. And the only thing that fed these machines was cow dung and no sophisticated bio digesters. There was a pit next to the machine in each village with a plastic tarp over it. The natural biological decay of the cow dung was producing methane gas. It also produces carbon dioxide. That goes away, you can't stop that. It will end up there anyway. And a lot of carbon monoxide poison. It turns out that the way our combustors work, the methane and the carbon monoxide mix just fine along with moisture, go through the engine, work just fine. It turns out, by the way, methane gas by itself is 21 times as bad for the environment as CO2. And then it becomes CO2 anyway. If you collect it locally and feed the engines, you're protecting the global environment, you're getting rid of a source of disease in these places, and you're giving people electricity without taking any new source of carbon into the atmosphere. We believe you could probably build these machines at high volume at reasonable cost as well. We're working on a next generation of it right now. As I said, neither the water machine nor the electric generation system have a punchline yet. I'm one crazy lunatic, remember, doing this by myself in New Hampshire and now even putting these things around by myself. But we heard that you don't like the solution from the right and you don't like the solution from the left, so take the solution from the nut. Anyway, so... Um, so. <laughs>